use it kind of as a way of talking about um, the experience of, of writing about science. Um, I, um, I am not a scientist. I'm an old, uh, unreformed English major. Uh, I took some science classes in college. I should have taken more. But for some reason, they were all at 8 in the morning. And they were all like a mile away. <laughs> I, I had my priorities. You know, I was sleeping. So it was stupid. But in any case, um, uh, a couple of years out of college, um, I got a job at Discover Magazine, and you know I was just looking for a place where I could learn about the business, and uh, I discovered I really enjoyed writing about science, uh, learning about science, calling up people and having them explain their science to me, and I kind of thought back to how much science had meant to me growing up, and just without it having a big science label with a capital S on it. And, um, you know, I think, and, and in hindsight, I have to say that probably a, a, a key moment in, in my young life when I was, you know, um, I don't know how I would have been, maybe 13 or 14, was, was when I was quite traumatized by seeing a movie. Um, has anybody not seen Alien? <laughs> All right, so, so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so there I am, I don't know, I'm like 13 or something like that, and uh, somehow, I don't know if I stuck into the theater or what, but uh, I see this movie that totally freaks me out. Um, and you have to bear in mind that, you know, this movie which came out around 1980, there really hasn't been anything quite like it before. I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of a standard issue now, but um, a truly terrifying, biologically plausible alien was kind of new. Um, but, you know, of course at the time, I, I, I um, you know, I assumed that it was, it, it was, it was quite a stretch for real biology. You know, I mean, okay, here you have this alien that's spewing out acid and, and like, and apparently the acid can go all the way through the spaceship. You think like, okay, well, A, why doesn't the spaceship just suddenly get a vacuum and suck all the air out? Or B, how is that alien not like melting itself? <laughs> um, but, well, but I think what is really like terrifying to everybody, most of all, is the way that this alien reproduces, which is that um, it's got that egg, and the egg cracks open, and then this thing uh, comes out, and it jumps on a host's face, clamps on, and wraps its tail around its neck, and then uh, you know, it stays there for a while, and then kind of disappears. And if you remember in the movie, John Hurt, the actor, he gets one of these things on his face, and then it disappears, and everyone says, well, well that's a movie. Uh, and then, of course, he gets very hungry and has a big, big breakfast. And then, shortly afterwards, that thing just rips out of his chest because it's been in there roaming. Um, I think that this probably kind of uh, formed my sense of, of what parasites might be in some sort of deep, unconscious way. Uh, and uh, early on, when I was uh, working on, um, when, when I started to go from writing magazine articles to writing books, I finished my first book, which is called At the Water's Edge, and I was kind of casting around for another idea. And, I don't know, I was, I, uh, was talking with my agent one day, and, and I was like, you know, I've always had kind of a thing for parasites. And there's actually a lot of science out there, so what do you think? And he was like, yeah. So, so I looked into it. Um, and there were a lot of things that actually really surprised me because I, I started to realize that, you know, uh, a lot of people didn't share that kind of sense of how disturbing and creepy and cool parasites could be. In fact, you know, if you think about the word parasite, uh, it can connote um, being a, uh, uh, you know, just a, someone who's sucking the life out of other people, you know. Someone who, a, a visitor who comes to hang out with you and eats all the food in your refrigerator and never seems ready to leave. And actually, believe it or not, the, the, there's a big 
um, cultural um, tradition of this, even in science. So to look at parasites as being uh, really uh, not impressive, and in fact being degenerate. This picture is of E. Ray Lancaster, who was a British naturalist in the late 19th century, uh, and was at the time one of one of the great uh, naturalists uh, of, of his day. Um, he had met Darwin as a boy, actually, and, and as a as a scientist, he had um, uh, really helped to to um, make Darwin's ideas uh, the, the foundation. <coughs> of natural history, so that people would look at species and try to understand how they had evolved, which is an incredibly important thing to do. Um, but, you know, he was a man of his time, and part of being a man of that time meant that you had a very strong, powerful um, sense uh, about the nature of progress. So, um, you know, so you know, humans were, were believed to be sort of like the, the ultimate um, end in, in, the, in the progress of the history of life. And that as, as civilization marched forward, we were sort of actually making life progress even further. Um, and of course, for someone like Lancaster, the, <coughs> the, the pinnacle of, of human achievement and civilization was Victorian England. Um, and yet, uh, there were cases. I mean, if you look in history, there are, there are cases where, where there isn't progress. You know, things fall apart. Uh, and so, how do you explain that? And amazingly, uh, Lancaster and other people tried to explain that through a kind of a reverse evolution. And for them, that's where parasites became really uh, valuable. So let me introduce you to one parasite, one of, actually one of my favorites, um, something called Saculina. So Saculina is actually a, a crustacean, you know, so it's related to lobsters and shrimp and, and other free-living animals. Uh, it actually belongs to a group of crustaceans, the barnacles. So you might think of barnacles as being kind of clamped to a rock. So that's what most barnacles do. But some of them have become parasites. And so what happened, and so this shows you a crab, which is the host of Saculina, and that yellow pouch at the bottom, that's actually um, where the female has sort of been, female Saculina is bulging out on the inside of the crab's body. What happens is that, um, you know, this is, what happens is that when Saculina is a little larva, basically, it's actually free living. It's got that big black spot as an eye. It's got little legs it uses to look around. And it actually looks for a, uh, a host. And so that might be like a little, um, maybe that would be like a little eel or something on a crab or something. The, it's the, uh, so Saculina lands on there. And as you can see in the sequence, it actually, um, kind of sheds those legs and things that he used to swim around. And it's got this kind of little syringe for a mouth. And it ejects some of its cells into the crab. Just a few cells. And the, and the cells themselves kind of swim along like a little worm until they get to um, the, the base of the crab inside its body. 